So uh, the last subject I want to look at in detail is processing. So the story for processing is that finally we have a data set that lets us get away from our narrow azimuth kind of 2D assumptions that we've been using for 3D marine processing and do something a bit more interesting. So while azimuth processing represents a challenge, we have huge data volumes. We're going to put 460 blocks of Walker Ridge wide azimuth data library through reverse time migration. That's a lot of CPUs. And if we're going to require 2.5 terabytes of, of raw high density onshore wise data a day um, in Qatar, I mean, that's going to take a lot of disk space. So there's a lot of stuff going in the background to support this. But at the same time, it provides an opportunity. Uh, we have these true 3D data collections which allow us to uh, use true 3D algorithms and improve multiple noise suppression and we can also improve our Boston model building and imaging and there for example is one of these uh, wide azimuth gathers so this is a common image gather so instead of it just being a 2D thing that you used to see with 3D narrow azimuth size this wide azimuth gather is a 3D image gather now with offsets in the X and Y direction so we're just going to look at a few pieces of the processing puzzle. Um, interpolation has always been an important part of the sequence, especially prior to imaging. And uh, we've developed a 5D wide azimuth interpolation and regularization operator. Uh, this has come out of Calgary, where they've been working with wide azimuth data for, for, uh, for many years. And as we go through some of these uh, wide azimuth processing solutions, you'll see that already there's a, a worldwide flavor to them. So the 5D operator allows us to do a better job of the interpolation. Um, it can infill larger gaps more effectively and it's <coughs> ADO and uh, amplitude versus azimuth friendly, which is important. If you just have a, a little look in that area on the section, you can see that after interpolation, as expected, things are more co coherent, better signal to noise. On the demultiple side, one of the first things that we had to do was have a look at our 3D SRME, get it to work with uh, wide azimuth data. But in fact, 3D SRME loves wide, uh, wide azimuth data. Um, the, the additional kind of cross-line offsets that you get from the wide azimuth data allows to get a much more effective multiple model, which results in far better multiple attenuation. <coughs> so we're looking at some wave equation migration images here, that's the raw. And that's after we apply 3D SRME to the input data for the migration. Much cleaner. So all that messy multiple energy has been removed. So despite the fact that wide azimuth has this kind of inherent ability to do its own demultiple with the Arial stack, it still benefits from uh, additional demultiple processes. We developed a 3D radon transform. Unfortunately, there are real data examples to show you. So I'm just going to show you a quick synthetic on this. Uh, this has come out of our, um, one of our dedicated centers in Europe in collaboration with the client. So what we have here is we have three primaries, which are the flat thing, and three multiples, which are the kind of uh, dipping bodies. Now uh, the multiple in the middle is an isotropic or it's a dipping multiple. And what you see is that 2D algorithms, or even 2D algorithms by the azimuth sectors, can't really provide good discrimination of this dipping multiple, whereas the 3D algorithm, of course, can. But these 3D data collections allow us to do 3D to apply 3D algorithms and improve things like denoise and demultiple. Finally, wireless imaging. So what we need to do for wide azimuth imaging is we need to honour the true source and receiver locations. We want to include TTI and isotropy. One of the big things that we have to do is we have to pick residual curvature on these 3D gathers. So we're no longer picking events, we're picking surfaces. We then have to feed them into a tomography that's been adapted to wide azimuth data. And now we're going to run it through our, our imaging algorithms. As it turns out, imaging algorithms are pretty much inherently 3D, so this is no problem. The main, the main work that was done was to do the 3D picking on the gathers and the wide azimuth tomography. So again, let's just have a little look at some wide azimuth imaging. So this is a fast track wave equation migration in the Gulf. I'm going to compare it to RTM. And you can see that in these more complex zones, the RTM is providing an improved image. 
as we would expect. So, fracture characterization is my final, final topic. It turns out that our wide azimuth approach to processing these 3D algorithms uh, inherently preserve our azimuthal signature, the very thing that we want for fracture characterization. This includes the amplitude, so amplitudes versus azimuth, velocities, seismic attributes, all, the, all those things that we want to use. And the improved offset azimuth <coughs> diversity gives us a better data set for the fracture characterization to allow us to do interesting <coughs> things like this where we derive fracture intensity and azimuth from the seismic volume. Just leaving you with a question. Are we really going to see wide azimuth worldwide? Well, the first point is that, as we've demonstrated in the Gulf, in certain geological contexts, our azimuth has reached its limit. If we want to move forward, we need to do something a bit more dramatic. Wide azimuth, for example. So the big question, the $100 million question, roughly the cost of drilling a deep water well or a well in a high pressure, high temperature environment is do we want to open up new plays where currently we have no images at all, no idea of what's going on, subsalt, sub basalt? Yes. Do we want to reduce drilling costs in deep water? Absolutely. And do we want to characterise difficult reservoirs, i.e. reservoirs where <coughs> current narrow azimuth seismic fails to provide the information we need for fracture characterization and things like that, for example. So, um, my solution is, uh, you know, we're only a phone call away at CPG Veritas. <laughs> I'm happy to shamelessly commercially plug our land marine seabed services. Um, if you found the talk interesting and want any more information, please have a look at our website. Any questions? Um, this is Slater, Atlantic Petroleum. Thank you, Roger, for a good talk. Um, the killer question is, what is the cost increment? Uh, well, I, I wouldn't worry about the cost increment. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the hundred million dollar question. <laughs> as Mr. Rolls said to Mr. Rice once, forget the price, it's the quality they'll remember. Uh, but seriously, it's, it's not so much a cost increment, it's a cost-benefit exercise. We're not saying use wide azimuth to shoot you know, flat sediments, uh, flat shallow sediments, uh, um, where you know, 2D or 3D, 3D data is fine, but obviously there's going to be some scenarios where the only option if you want to get a reasonable energy is use wide azimuth. So deep water, high pressure, high temperature, environments, <coughs> Middle East, close climate. Um, have you done any uh, sub basalt imaging using wide azimuth? Uh, no, we've not. Um, we came fairly close to it, but uh, I think we're going to see something. Uh, we're going to see something published. We see some activity on that next year. Thank you. Uh, Ian Jack, mostly retired or partly retired. Um, the cost of uh, historically the cost of ocean bottom surveys used to be six or seven times the cost of a towed cable survey. Um, that was with narrow azimuth or no azimuth. Um, now, with the wide azimuth, presumably that ratio has reduced somewhat, maybe 3 to 1 or 2 to 1. So wouldn't it be more sensible just to go to the seabed where you've got the, all the attractions of the wide azimuth, uh, all azimuths in fact, uh, and good sampling, uh, and the additional improvements of the physics of the, of the ocean bottom situation? Absolutely, and PZ summation and multi-component uh, yeah. better repetition and everything. Yeah, why not? So why don't we scrap streamers altogether? Well, <laughs> well, 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 I think all the seismic contractors have, have had a, have always had an interest in multi-component, and as yet we've seen we've not seen sufficient take-up from the oil industry to actually get off the ground on an economic scale. And we're ready to do it as long as you pre-commit to it and we'll build the equipment. And it seems that it needs to claw its way out of the valley of death. But it does have its niche applications, certainly around the infrastructure and, uh, and things like that where you can't get to those treatments. But I can see Chris shaking his head. So <laughs> yeah, no doubt Chris Walker will help us uh, understand that issue later on. After his crucified.